Jules Masserman, professor of psychiatry at Northwestern University and president of the International Society for Social Psychiatry, I do not believe that total abolition of hospitalization for serious behavior disorders, which is a term preferable to mental diseases, is at present either advisable or practical. And I'll try to clarify that position on psychiatric as well as legal and social grounds later in this discussion. I am Thomas Sass, professor of psychiatry at the State University of New York in Syracuse. My position is that involuntary mental hospitalization should be abolished. I'm Harold Wasowski. I'm professor and chairman of the Department of Psychiatry at Northwestern Medical School. And as a former director of the Illinois Department of Mental Health, I'm interested in a broad discussion of this issue. And I will serve as the moderator for this discussion. <laughs> exploration of concepts and controversies in modern medicine. One of a series of programs dedicated to examining the uncertain, candidly recognizing that much of today's teaching is necessarily based upon opinions and that the opinions of eminent physicians in a given field vary widely. The National Medical Audiovisual Center believes that openly airing such opposing views is a basic responsibility of medical communications. Dr. Harold Vysotsky, Chairman, Department of Psychiatry at Northwestern Medical School, will act as moderator of this presentation. We will be discussing uh, the issue of whether any conditions justify involuntary commitment of persons diagnosed as being mentally ill. There is a point of view which holds that involuntary commitment is never justified, that only voluntary commitment is ever justified in a democratic society. This point of view is supported on the basis of both libertarian views and the strong criticism of the quality as well as the intensity of mental health care and treatment in our mental institutions. When this is applied to uh, harmless and eccentric acting uh, individuals or peculiarly acting individuals in our society, we can see that this position can be strongly supported. However, when we see individuals who are clearly violent in their intent and in their propensity, uh, and we see suicidal persons and patients uh, in catatonic immobility. What does society have to do in order to safeguard their health and the health of society? And so involuntary commitment may be justifiable under what condition? And in this discussion, we would like to cover all of these areas. The second uh, point uh, involves the consideration of confining individuals uh, against their will because of the undesirable activities and uh, the role that predictability, our ability to predict their acting out uh, has in involuntary commitment. I should like to start this discussion with the presentation of the view of Dr. Sass. Well, I think I can best present uh, my uh, reasoning uh, which urges the abolition of all involuntary mental hospitalization and treatment by first citing uh, a quite typical uh, example of it from the popular press uh, or the kind of circumstance uh, uh, which is considered to justify it and then uh, enumerating my reasoning. Now, I will quote very briefly from last week's Time magazine which relates to the story of a 62-year-old prominent attorney, whose name need not be mentioned, uh, a graduate of the Harvard Law School, uh, an official of the United Church of Christ, who boarded uh, an airplane uh, from Boston to Washington, uh, and uh, with a broad grin, asked the stewardess, how long does it take to Cuba? Uh, he was hauled off the plane, and when he was not sufficiently contrite, uh, I quote, uh, one of the police officers told him, I, you be careful of what you say, 
or will send you to a state insane asylum for a 30-day examination. End of quote. Now, I consider this a typical example of the way psychiatry, in institutional psychiatry is used and not an abuse of it. If this man had not been as prominent as he was, he may very well have ended up in a psychiatric hospital. Now, the theoretical underpinnings of my position. First, I contend that psychiatry, and I distinguish sharply between psychiatry and neurology. Neurology deals with disease of the brain. I contend that what we now call psychiatry deals not with any kind of disease, but with human conflict, or what I have sometimes called problems in living. It deals, uh, as Dr. Wisatsky already alluded to, for example, with people who behave deviant, uh, deviantly or violently. Now, that, what we call violent behavior, after all, is conflict. Somebody does not like the violence. Secondly, it is my opinion that confronted uh, with an individual, and I don't think we should call uh, such an individual a patient too readily, because the word patient implies that the person is sick and perhaps uh, needs uh, medical treatment. Uh, in my opinion, he's not a patient, he's a person, an individual, uh, who feels troubled. Thirdly, then, we come to the issue that commitment, as presently practiced and as historically justified, has been supported by a very ambiguous and confusing dual justification, namely that it helps the individual, for example, uh, if he's suicidal by preserving his life, I'll come back to this, and it also helps society by protecting society from unpleasant or harmful so-called mental patients. Now, I contend that these two functions have nothing in common and must be separated. Helping an individual must, in my opinion, in a free society, always be free and contractual. Whereas protecting society is very eminently a legitimate function of society, but must, in my opinion, be exercised under the rubric of the law and due process, and never under the rubric of medicine or science or mental health. In short, then, taking as uh, a category of so-called mental patients those about whom, uh, or with respect to whom, involuntary interventions are perhaps most uh, easily justified, namely the so-called violent patients, uh, uh, the Oswalds, as it were. My view is that, indeed, uh, violence is real, and a great many people in modern society who misbehave are nowadays called mentally ill. But my view is that although their violence is real, this is not an illness, and that in fact what we witness is the violence and uncivilized behavior of the mental patient being met by the violence, by the counter-violence and similarly uncivilized behavior of psychiatry, so that involuntary mental hospitalization is in effect a kind of counter-violence against the sometimes violence of so-called mental patients. Now in sum, my view is, is that if individuals do not injure or threaten to injure others, help, medical psychiatric help should be offered to them, but under no circumstances would it be justifiable to coerce them to accept so-called help. If they threaten or injure others or society, then they fall clearly in the class of those individuals for whom the criminal law and its sanctions are designed, and they should be restrained under the auspices of the criminal law, not of psychiatry. I think Dr. Masselman may want to discuss his aspects of this issue a little bit more broadly and perhaps to initiate the uh, discussion of Dr. Sasse's position, and I think we ought to get to it as soon as possible. Well, thank you, Harold. Tom, let's make my discussion completely impersonal so that uh, there's nothing other than scientific 
issues between us. We're old friends. We were trained together at the University of Chicago, I think, at the beginning of the Pleistocene age, as I remember it, and both at the university and at the Institute for Psychoanalysis, both sort of mavericks then. And I've followed your career with mixed feelings. Mostly, I must confess, a good deal of admiration for your courage and your honesty and putting your own position on the line for your beliefs. I think a little bit of amusement because you take yourself so very seriously as a Jeremiah le sort of lecturing the sinning Israelites when most of us agree with you, actually, on very important issues. I must also say that I've had a good deal of trepidation and some sorrow because some of your extreme statements, I think, impair your position and, in a sense, make it more difficult to help those with serious behavior disorders rather than mental diseases and, in effect, uh, impair some of our images more than necessary. Now, I don't want to play antics with semantics. Let, let's clarify what we mean by mental diseases in the first place, because you use the term. I use behavior disorders. Now, in modern philosophy and modern science, we don't deal with things. We deal with processes, with interactions, with dynamics. So when you talk about the mind, it isn't a thing, it's a process. If you change it from a noun to a verb, what does it mean? When we put our mind to something, we perceive, we see, we hear, we feel. You can say these are neurological processes and therefore are subject to the term of disease when they go awry. Perfectly true. But when we remind ourselves of something, we use our memory. We place it in the context of previous experience. Now that experience can be highly distorted, don't you see? And it gets into the social sphere. The sphere of individual relationships with other people. And then finally, when we mind our manners, or mind the laws, or mind society, or mind culture, this is certainly a social process. And so when we talk about the mind, we're talking not only about physical, but also about social relationships. Now, let me be a little bit more radical than you are. I agree that there's hardly a, something we call a mental disease in the backwards of any hospital that somewhere in this world, in some other culture, would be considered not only normal, but commendable. A person in an epileptic fugue who sees visions might be a holy man somewhere. A person who is a paranoiac is perfectly normal in a dobu society where everybody is suspicious of everybody else. Uh, somebody who we call exhibitionistic would be considered perfectly normal in a um, nudist colony, and if he tried to wear anything, would be considered obsessive compulsive or what, and that's perfectly true. Then, it's a relative thing, but then what do we mean by disease? Disease means that somebody's uneasy about something, which means that behavior is unpredictable. Now, this can be either individual or social. And this clarifies the whole concept, because an individual can be uneasy about organic disease, but he can also be exceedingly uneasy about his social relationships, he can be uneasy about his philosophy. So we have existential anxiety. And they can be uneasy enough, so they appeal for help and want it. And sometimes can be so uneasy, they're confused and anxious and depressed and sometimes suicidal and don't know where to seek help and must be given it. Now, the society can be uneasy about these individuals also. Society is uneasy about the same three categories, physical, social, and philosophical. So, society is uneasy about pollution, about the spread of diseases. This is physical. But society is also uneasy about individuals that, that transgress its cultural norms. And this extends beyond crime. And society is also uneasy about philosophy, so we go to the moon uh, to settle our cosmology, and we invent new religious systems to settle what we believe as uh, values in life. All of these can get so deviant that an individual must interact with society in certain ways so that both are protected. Now, let me give you examples. Would you call epilepsy a disease? It's certainly a physical disease, isn't it? It's uh, deviations in electroencephalogram. It's treated by drugs. You can find lesions in the brain in some cases and so on. But it's also a social disease. Would you want to drive with uh, an epileptic uh, bus driver? 
Would you like to uh, have an epileptic pilot fly your plane? Uh, who's going to judge that, a lawyer or a judge? You've got to have a psychiatrist say, look, this individual must be regulated because a psychiatrist has special information, both on the physical and on the social planes, as to what the interaction can be. What would you judge about a general paretic, for example? Can a lawyer diagnose that? Is it simply a question of some neurologist saying disease of the brain? You must also judge as to what his behavior can be social-wise. Now, I wish we had psychiatrists at the time, shall we say, of uh, Frederick the Great, who was a paretic. He saved an awful lot of trouble. Or Genghis Khan, who may have been a paretic. If psychiatrists had judged, these people should have been put under regulation. Despite the laws that they themselves passed, a great deal of human sorrow would have been saved. And so, while I agree with you, we must not use our position as determiner of men's lives and liberty and so on. We still have special information and special training that do indicate when individuals need to be protected from themselves and society needs to be protected from them for mutual benefit. And this sometimes does take uh, medical and psychiatric as well as legal process. You know, I can't um, help hearing as I listen to both of you mm -hmm. uh, a certain uh, theme that comes through. You, uh, you, Jules, feel that if psychiatrists were around when Genghis Khan was around or Frederick the Great, that they could have stopped the activity. That was a political power decision. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure that uh, psychiatrists are as powerful as you would want them to be or as Tom fears that they are. And I think maybe this is the, uh, the concept that we have to discuss. There is one issue that I'd like to take up with you, Tom, and that has to do with one of the statements that you said, that if individuals threaten or injure others, they fall into the class of criminal law and should be handled by the, uh, the criminal system. Uh, you know, I'm also in agreement with most of the concepts of how to deal humanely with individuals who are deviant or have problems or maybe ill uh, by both their definition and ours. But when we say that when individuals threaten or injure someone on the basis of illness or what might be deviant behavior and then to put them into the uh, criminal justice system which is an impure and imperfect system even for others, it seems like we're doubling the stigma. They have a clearly deviant pattern which whether we diagnose it as mental illness or society diagnoses as being crazy or queer, uh, you then superimpose another kind of jurisdictional system, that of the criminal law. And uh, what do we do? do we, if they are guilty, do we send them to jails, which are imperfect uh, facilities? You've equated jails with state hospitals, so it doesn't matter. You're saying, uh, you're saying what society is saying, let's get them out of here. Let's extrude them. And uh, whether we use a medical system to extrude them or a legal system, we'll get them out. What are you saying? Well, of course it doesn't matter. Uh, we hardly have the time to uh, do justice to this subject, uh, but uh, the thrust of my writings has been uh, directed in the last few years uh, towards explicating precisely the differences that ensue whether someone is dealt with as a potential mental patient or as a potential criminal. First of all, if someone uh, is dealt uh, with under the criminal law. This doesn't mean putting him in uh, prison. It may mean uh, uh, imposing a money fine on him, uh, possibly imposing a suspended sentence on him. As or putting yet. him in a hospital. Now, my contention is that a hospital ought not to be used in lieu of a jail. But I would like, just like to make one comment, uh, one further comment on what you said, Harold, because, uh, of course, you are right uh, in a historical, in a uh, historical sense, historically psychiatry and many of the renamings of social problems as mental illnesses has come into being in an effort to humanize, to liberalize a harsh, uh, uncivilized uh, penological practices. Uh, but you can't, uh, I believe you can't uh, correct one deficiency by erecting an illusory and uh, uh, sometimes uh, equally harsh, if not worse, uh, uh, system in, in place of it. In other words, uh, the whole tendency to say, yes, jails are bad, therefore we should lock up people in mental hospitals, is all wrong. Uh, 
because then mental hospitals A, mental hospitals will become just as bad. B, what is lost in the process is the entire body built up over the last 700 years in uh, English and, and American law of uh, determining whether in fact someone is the criminal or not, or whether he has been falsely accused or whether there are mitigating circumstances and so on. But Tom, you just uh, raised two issues that I think are very apropos. In the first place, historically, Psychiatrists such as Pinnell, Escarol, William Tooke, uh, Earl Vaughn in this country and so on, have liberated people. They took chains off. They didn't put them on. And modern hospitals do their best to get patients out as soon as possible. I don't know whether you've visited some of the modern hospitals recently. I work with them all the time. They're places that are rather attractive and hygienic and interested in uh, getting people out curing people, which means caring for them, is exactly the same route, as soon as possible. So I, I wonder why you equate hospitals with jails. Well, uh, may I respond to this directly? Uh, as you both know, uh, but I th as I think it's, uh, I may be uh, allowed to uh, uh, explicate to this audience, uh, my view is that Pinel did not liberate mental patients, that all this this kind of description uh, in psychiatric history is uh, critification. Pinel liberated mental patients like Jefferson liberated the Negro. He ran a more elegant plantation. My essential thesis is that liberty, human liberty, is indivisible. If you can't leave a building, it's a jail. If you can't leave a farm, if you are recaptured and put back to work, it doesn't matter whether you have, whether you eat 2,000 calories or 800, whether you have a decent house and you can have your wife around you, it's a plantation and you are a slave. And I am not talking about the improvement of mental health. I'm not talking about doing away with abuses. I am talking, I'm analogizing involuntary hospitalization to involuntary servitude. I'm analogizing treatment to contractual labor. You either have contractual labor or you have slavery. You either have voluntary treatment and hospitalization or involuntary. Well, I don't how much nicer the hospitals are in Illinois or anywhere else is not, because uh, no ice is nice in hotel. As, as a matter of fact, I'm not satisfied with the hospitals in Illinois. I, I am concerned, mm -hmm. if I were following your train of thought, Tom, that what do you do with a patient who is uh, suicidal and who's made suicidal gestures? Now, I've had discussions with students of law and they say a man's body is his own. You know, they, they, fo they follow mills. Uh, a moral concept. Uh, uh, it may be that in a Pollyannish way, uh, John Doan, that no man is an island, uh, is also a kind of moral uh, concept. Uh, what do you do with a man who is clearly suicidal? Do you put him in jail? Uh, he's breaking the law if he commits suicide, if he makes an attempt. Uh, but Harold, uh, first of all, uh, you realize, I hope you realize, and I want to make this again very clear, we have slipped into a purely moral discourse. Now, whether or not suicide is or is not a permissible act, or what kind of an act it is, has nothing to do, as, I can see, as, as far as I can see, with medicine or psychiatry. Now, let's see it as a conflict. Uh, you deal with the aspects of conflict. A man has a conflict with his environment, and he wishes to leave it well, by, one, by killing himself. One second. The whole concept of a man being suicidal is psychiatric euphemism. If a man wants to kill himself, how do you know it? Does he tell you? In what context does he tell you? Secondly, my contention is, and presumably this differs in a very radical way from the standard psychiatric view, is a purely moral view, a personal view, like religion. One person is Catholic, another one is Jewish. My view is that suicide is an unqualified human right. This is not to say that making a suicidal gesture by standing on the 20th floor of a building in Manhattan is a human right. That's well, disturbing the peace. Well, in that case, Tom, you would also say that alcoholism is a qualified, unqualified human right, that a person can deprive his wife and his children, have a proper parenthood, that uh, all sorts of things that really affect society rather deeply are human rights. Now, an alcoholic... Let's admit right away, the law is just about as crazy as uh, <laughs> some of the old uh, psychiatric notions were. For example, in California, if you're just found with a little marijuana on you, you get five years in jail. LSD has gotten, uh, gotten to around to it yet. Uh, to and uh, psychiatrists are put in a position, really, that are impossible. For example, you can't hang a man or electrocute him legally 
unless he's found sane. A psychiatrist can be called in by a lawyer, say, or by the governor, say, will you please certify this man as sane so we can electrocute him? The psychiatrist becomes the executioner. There are all sorts of absolutely, if you will, insane things about it. But on the other hand, suicide affects not only the individual, it affects many other people, the person's family, his children, his associates, his friends. This is a social problem. It cannot be left up to the judgment of the individual. Well, let's take another instance. Let's take General Paris. As always, you can say this is syphilis of the brain, this is a disease, this belongs to neurologists and internists, not psychiatrists. But suppose the general product is still infectious, and he thinks he's a Napoleon, and he can go around and infect as many women as possible, and he is a real social danger. Uh, he doesn't think he needs to be hospitalized, and for, as a matter of fact, he can hire a lawyer to defend him. Would you let such an individual, just because he has uh, the advantage of uh, the um, Constitution, free and society to infect women, to uh, invoke his delusional system on other people? When, as a matter of fact, he'd be much better off in the long run, so would society if he were treated under temporary, involuntary commitment. I would want my brother to be treated so. You can see that uh, we haven't uh, discussed this as broadly as we would have wanted to. Uh, rather, we have opened the discussion, which must go on, not only here, and we will go on for the rest of the day, I'm sure, but must go on with the members of the audience to look into themselves as to what role they want to play in this. Do they want to follow a role in which the psychiatrist deals with those individuals who see themselves as being in conflict, and having difficulties with society and come voluntarily to him? Or do they feel that, as some of us may feel, that some individuals will, will not come to us and uh, through not coming to us uh, may injure themselves or others or uh, be in some sort of difficulty with the world around them? This is a very important issue and can't be debated. I think it requires great understanding and broad discussion amongst all of us. We thank Dr. Jules Masserman, Dr. Thomas Saz, and Dr. Harold Dasatsky for their interesting analysis of a critical problem in patient care. In subsequent programs, we shall continue to record equally significant concepts and controversies in modern medicine. The opinions expressed on this program do not necessarily constitute endorsement by the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, the Public Health Service, or its constituents. Mm -hmm.